Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Well Goose online author event. For um, those that haven't met me before, my name's Jane. I work for Well Goose and we are the publishing house of the Iona community. And we're here tonight to celebrate a new book, which we're, we couldn't be prouder of. We're just like, as I would say, chuffed to wee bits about this book. If you can see there, Ruth is holding it up and... Also on your screen, you should see Pauline Steinberger, who's our author, and she's going to be in conversation with Ruth. I'm assuming that most of you already know Ruth, even if you don't know me. So, well, just we are a tiny publishing house. We are essentially me, Iona, who is behind the scenes there, keeping us all in and out the rooms and making it all work. And Sandra, who's also online tonight. If Sandra's here, say hello, Sandra. Sandra is our manager and the incredible editor of this book and most of our books. The other person who's missing tonight, and I'm going to apologise to those of you that normally come to these events and we're expecting Neil. No Neil tonight, he couldn't make it and um, let's face it, he is a better host than me because he can also sing and play music. None of that tonight. So sorry about that, just me. And I also wanted to say that I'm Really grateful for everybody's time tonight because I know it's Ash Wednesday, it's the first night of Lent, it's also Valentine's Day. So the fact that you've chosen to spend your time with us means a lot, it really does. And about us too, I don't know, I have a wee audience question right before I start. How many people here already have the book? Oh, I see a few thumbs up, few hands. It's not a test. You don't get judged, honestly. And anyway, honestly, see, by the time you finish tonight, you're all going to want to buy the book, trust me. So it doesn't matter if you don't have it yet. You'll have it by the end of the night. But the other thing I wanted to say was just a huge thank you to everybody who buys our books, who clicks on our downloads, who reads our newsletters, who comes to our website. Because publishing's a really strange little enterprise. It's an act of faith every time. We put books out in the world and we hope that they educate, they inspire, they they bring something to the world. But you don't always know. And it is a sort of blind act of faith every time. And when we said, oh, right, we're going to do a yoga book, you can imagine. Even for us, that was quite left field. It was not going to be a guaranteed success. And Sandra and I and Neil and Iona, we had great faith in it, but we weren't. You know, people were a little sceptical. And in fact, here we are, it's only out a month and we're in our second printing. So sometimes you just got to take those leaps. And thanks to Pauline, who also is putting a huge amount of her own time and effort to help us get this book out there. This book is having a buzz. It's having a moment. And it's really lovely that you're all here tonight to share the moment with us and to get a little deeper into what it's about, because it's not just a yoga book. It's about much more than that. So I'm going to hand over to Ruth and to Pauline, and they're going to give us a much bigger picture than I have about what this book is. So thanks again, everybody, for coming. And um, over to Ruth. Thank you, Jane, and thanks, Sandra and Iona. And just for those who, who don't know me, because I'm, I'm sure there are some here who've, who've just joined for the book. Um, my name's Ruth. I work for the Iona community as the leader. Um, and I'm here in that role. But actually, it's a huge delight to be here with Pauline because we go back a very long way. Um, it's not often that you get to work with your chums, but Pauline, you and I go back. I think you'd, you'd worked out 33 years. Yeah, we met when we started training um at New College in Edinburgh, uh, doing our Bachelor in Divinity, and both candidates for the Church of Scotland Ministry. Yep, um, and, 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 and. So it's just such a delight that you're here, um, and thank you for all you've given for, in this book. Um, I've got a few questions, folks, and then we're going to pause for a little bit, and Iona's going to send us off into little breakout rooms, but you'll have a chance just to talk to two or three others. So what do you make of that so far? And then we'll come back, and I'll have a few more questions with Pauline. And then we'll close with some Q and A's. Um, you can put your questions into the chat if you want, um, and then I'll invite you up to have a conversation in the in the front here with Pauline and me. So the first set of questions, and I'm going to just begin, Pauline, by asking you to tell us a bit about yourself, who you are, what do you do in life, and um, yeah, how how come you're here today with this book? 
Oh, thank you, Ruth. And thanks to the whole team for everything that you've done and for making tonight possible. So I'm Pauline. I was born and baptised in Glasgow. I'm an only child uh, to fantastic parents. Grew up in various churches because my dad moved around quite a bit. Um, so had a real sense of different denominations. In my teens, I went to the music hall in Aberdeen and saw uh, a traveling evangelist from the US carrying this huge <laughs> big wooden cross. And although I thought I knew my faith, I really saw and had a sort of visceral connection with that cross and it made Jesus very real. Um, and I guess that is the, the focus of, of my life. It's what defines me. Um, I then felt I had a call to ministry quite young, preached in my church, home church at the age of 16, standing on a family Bible because I couldn't see over the, the <laughs> Um And then, yeah, 11 years later, after two degrees, I was ordained into my first parish, age 27, in Dundee. So there have been a variety of parish ministries, team ministries, various roles in the Church of Scotland, uh, training, facilitating, um, hospice chaplaincy very involved with church without walls as well but it was it was whilst I was a hospice chaplain that I became very very interested in embodiment particularly in movement and breath and at that time I trained for three years with yoga Scotland to become a yoga teacher and I know it's unusual to be both ordained and a yoga teacher um but it, it's just where I feel God's asking me to be um and so since 2017, I've been a self-employed yoga teacher teaching in Southwest Scotland, North Cumbria. And uh, since 2019, I've been creatively innovating, designing practices to intersect classical Hatha yoga and Christian spirituality. And that is becoming my, my passion. Mm -hmm. And that's how the book came about, really, just through trying things out with a cohort of people all over the UK online. So the first the first sort of pilot of this material was sort of 2022 Lent. It, we, we sort of consolidated a little bit more last Lent and, and now here it is mm. and, for the group. I just want to just tell us about the book, give us an insight for those few on screen who will not yet have bought it and who, as Jane said, may well buy it later. Just guide us briefly through the book, Pauline. So briefly, it's about A5, spiral bound, really important because it is a practical resource. We want people to be able to lay it on the floor or on a table or outside on the grass or a beach and, and actually be free of the book, but then to, to go through the practices. There are eight practices in total, um, which will give you one for every week of Lent. And then there's one for Palm Sunday, Monday, mm -hmm. Thursday, good friday it's for you if you want to practice on a mat on the floor standing or if you just want to simply practice it in a chair or even in bed mm. there's a combination of physical stretches um as well as breathing exercises biblical reflection and it leads into a time of stillness a time of yeah. quietness for prayer meditation however you want to use that it's non-directive there are suggestions um, but it's very much for the individual. Could be done in pairs, could be done in a group, um, could be done in a, in a in a bigger context than that. But it, it's very much there for you to use the way that makes the most sense for you. Sure. Well, and I used it this morning, so I um, can testify to the spiral binding being very handy. Um, and it was a beautiful way to begin my um Ash Wednesday. Pauline, you've called the book Embody Lent. And so there are two really obvious questions which I'm going to ask and then we're going to pause. The first question is why embody? What is that all about for you and for Lent particularly? Yeah, if you Google embody, embodiment, embodied right now, it's huge. It's a really hot word and it has been for a while. Um, why that? Not to jump on, on that bandwagon, but because it means an awful lot to me. Um, to have a more visceral theology, the, the theology of the incarnation, Jesus, word made flesh, you know, God with skin on, his feet on this earth. You know, that, that's massive in terms of my faith, my spirituality. It's how I, how I sense that there is a God that identifies with me 
Um, mm. and with every other human being and with the, the planet that we're on. I think there is a sense too that certainly because we're living our lives more on screen, we're, we're more on our phones, you know, the, the, the digital world that we inhabit, there may be a sense in which uh, we want to come back to our senses more. Yep. Uh, and I really recognize that. Um, but more than that, in the book, I talk, talk uh, at some level, not enough perhaps, but about dualism, mm -hmm. which is not just something that's about our contemporary digital age. It goes way back to Greek philosophy. Greek philosophy very much influenced the New Testament and Paul's theology, the split that happened between mind and body. And it was a sort of superiority, inferior, inferiority split, i.e. mind, spirit, good, body, flesh, bad. I think that's not served as well. It comes up again in the Enlightenment. If you think of Descartes, for instance, um, you know, I think, therefore I am. And unfortunately, it, it, it has created quite an, a number of problems, I think, for women, especially. Um, I don't think that's unrelated to how long it took for us to be ordained. Um, but I think it also creates issues around sexuality, gender as well. So, yeah, embodiment matters at, 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 at a huge level to me in terms of rediscovering who, who and what I am in terms of my body. I am my body. I'm not just um, a mind in a body. I am my body. Yeah. I mean, we'll come back to that, and I'm sure there'll be questions around this because you know you, you've 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 juxtaposed these powerful notions, concepts. Which are so familiar, um, and then you know the notion of embodiment, and ours is a is an incarnate faith, our Christian faith, um, and yet we we tend to Im imagine that yoga comes from a tradition which doesn't relate to us in that sense. But we can come onto that a bit later because the other obvious question is why Lent? You do say in the book that this can be used at any time of the year, but you've chosen to connect this particular set of practices to the season of Lent which is just beginning today. And I see you've got your Ash um, <laughs> Yeah, I do. I, again, I think Lent is a very physical, visceral experience. You know, it focuses on Jesus in the desert and what he went through was a mind, body, you know, experience. Um, mm -hmm. The mental challenges of facing good and evil and the, the spiritual questions he had, who am I? Why am I here? Um, what's my calling? Um, and also the, the, you know, the, the fasting, the heat, the cold, the wild animals, um, the exposure, the isolation in the desert. Um, yeah, you couldn't have got anything that was more embodied that, than that. So it really fits with, with Lent. It's also a time of discipline, a time of um rediscovery maybe taking on a new challenge um i'm finding particularly in the, amongst the people i teach lent isn't just a time for christians there's, there's just a general feeling that mm. this time of year sort of january february march coming out of the winter is just time when people want to engage mm -hmm. with growth, with self-development with growth mm. And so what you offer us is a model for that. Um, and, and, and you're drawing on the experience of, of, the, of the Hatha Yoga tradition. Um, we're going to come back and talk a little bit about um, this fast paced, slow paced kind of dualism that, that you know, you've already been exploring. And we'll say we'll, we'll, we'll invite conversation then about, about um, you know, what, so what's this saying to us in the Iona community today? But I, I would like to pause there and I'm going to invite Iona to send us into wee breakout groups just for kind of five to seven minutes. Imagine that you're sitting in a room together and you're just being asked, so turn to your neighbour and, and say, what do you make of that then? Maybe make sure you know who, who each other is in the room and ask the question or respond to the question, what has drawn you to tonight's session? Why is it that you've come here? And what questions would you like to put to Pauline? And we'll make sure that we get as many of them shared um, after we've had the next set of questions. So welcome back one and all. Um, just to say that we will have time shortly for your questions and, and you can come and, and share them on screen with, with, with Pauline and me up here. But if you've got comments or questions um, that you might want to share, um, and, and voice yourself, or you might just want to put into the chat. Either way, put them into the chat so we can see what kind of questions are emerging um, 
um, if you want to. Um, but for now, I'm going to kick off again by going back to where we started, really, where we ended the last session. I asked Pauline why Lent. Um, and there was a third obvious question. And it's really, it's because I've had Pete Seeger going around in my head all day since I've begun reading the Ecclesiastes verse. For everything, turn, turn, turn. Fantastic song. But of course, these words of Ecclesiastes are from the, the Hebrew Testament. And I wanted to ask you, Pauline, why was it that you chose those words, those verses for this book? Yeah, because I love them, because I've used them so many different ways and places at, at funerals and weddings and baptisms. Um, they're universal, universally known and loved, as you say, you know, the, the song. Um, they're relatable. And I wanted something that was a leveller for, for everyone that might just be interested in picking up this book. I was hoping that, you know, people in, 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 in the church circles would pick up the book because they were curious maybe about Lent and yoga. But equally, I was really hopeful that the people in my yoga communities would see the, the word yoga, but then think, oh, what's what's this Lent thing? And mm -hmm. would also then engage with Ecclesiastes, mm -hmm. but then but then have an encounter with Jesus. So that, that was my hope. Mm -hmm. um, it pairs really, really well. Um, and of course, there's eight verses which pairs <laughs> back practices. Mm. Well, that's always very handy when, when that happens. But I mean, what I discovered this morning is that you, you offer a gentle introduction verse by verse, and, and then you, you gently remind me through the practice of, of that verse. Mm. Well, I'm going to turn my attention now to a question about this fast paced world that we live in, where global communications propel us to move really swiftly through our days. Uh, through our even through our nights as we we, we live with um, the, the busyness of the world uh, all around us how can the prayerfulness the mindfulness developed through yoga contribute to a more intentional and purposeful observance of of daily life um, prayerfulness particularly during Lent and, and I see there's a question there about you know does your yoga practice run parallel to other Christian kinds of prayer or does the one absorb the other? So I guess we're in that territory of, you know, tell us a bit more about the practices of prayerfulness that you as a Christian leader um, draw out of practices of yoga. Yeah. Yeah. So the first time I ever rolled out a yoga mat, what struck me was that I had this space and it was six feet by two feet, the size of the yoga mat. And it was just me on there. And anything else outside there, I could leave for that half an hour or that hour. And the movements were slow. I still teach slow movements. You can teach faster paced yoga, but I like the slow movement. And you combine that with slowing down your breath. The science of that is that that slows down our brain, our thinking mind, we're calming our central nervous system, we're regulating ourselves emotionally when we practice. And I think that's why it's so popular now in the West. Yoga has become mainstream as a health and well-being and mental health um, practice. How do I see that sitting with Christian spirituality and my own spirituality is that I think Prayer for me was also busy, fast paced and um, snatched moments or running through prayer lists, liturgies, Sunday morning prayers, public prayers. What I found on the yoga mat and what I still find today is that once I've started to slow down my body, slow down my thinking mind, slow down my breath, I'm more prepared to then sit, kneel, lie or stand for that quieter time in the silence with God and less restless by then mm -hmm. and more ready to listen and be open and so I have felt over the years that there's a closer deeper connection with with Jesus as a result of the yoga practice and because through the studies I've done um, you know, yoga definitely predates all world religions. So it's a philosophy, it's not a religion. It has been adopted by Hinduism and Buddhism. 
um, to enhance spiritual disciplines for those religions. So therefore, why shouldn't Christianity also adopt the tools of yoga for the same benefits for prayer and closeness to God? The word yoga in Sanskrit means union, means yoke. Um, and, and so ultimately, the yoga is not the goal. The yoga tools are not an end in themselves. They are the preparation to yoke, unite with the real presence of Christ. Wow, thank you. I mean, you just touched on a big topic, which um, I would like to just name, and it might come up in a question. You know, you talked about, you know, yoga, it predates all world religions. It's a philosophy. It's not a religion. Hinduism, Buddhism have embraced it. So why not Christianity? And and on the tip of my tongue is, but at what point does that become cultural appropriation? And and what does that, um, is that okay? Um yeah, so I guess that's the question, you know, cultural appropriation, um, a new form of colonialism um, where those with power use it in a way that is uh, over and against the other um, in all kinds of settings. Um, so I wonder what your thoughts are about, uh, you know, putting yoga practice in the heart of the, the heart of the heart of the Christian tradition so Lent within the Christian tradition yeah yeah it's, it's a risky thing to do um it, it's quite a courageous thing to do I guess I think that's probably why the book's selling because <laughs> it's provocative mm. in terms of culture appropriation I'm very very aware of it mm. uh, and you know the irony isn't lost on me that in some places where I teach I am a white, Western, Christian, fairly middle-class woman. Um, and in front of me are, um, particularly in, in Carlisle, we, we have quite a, a big community of people from Kerala now who are living and working here and are coming to the classes. I was beside a woman from Kerala today. And it's just about um, recognising the injustices of the past and, and not perpetuating or, or repeating them now, I always, always um, honour and mention that yoga is an ancient practice from the Indian continent pretty much every time I teach. Um, that's why I use the Sanskrit words, the postures, and you'll see that I've done that yeah. through, throughout the book and at the back. Um, you know, so, so the language isn't lost. So the origins aren't lost and the heritage isn't lost. Mm -hmm. Truthfully, yoga has evolved over the centuries from east to west, from teacher to teacher. You know, it was always taught by men originally. Mm -hmm. So in some ways, should women even be teaching now? But we are. And, and, I, and I do think there's a sense in which um, there's more learning and understanding of India because of yoga being mm -hmm. here and the practices. But I'm very, very careful that um, no symbolism or practices are misused or used in a way that is not respectful. And my classes are for free or donation. So I resist the commodification and the merchandising of what is somebody's sacred, sacred practice. Mm -hmm. um, however, in terms of Christianity, there are so many parallels. And um, that's why I say the intersection of, of yoga and Christian spirituality. There's a lot of parallels. There's so much we have in common. Um, and, you know, the desire for oneness, for wholeness, for unity. Um, yeah, I, I think that we learn. We learn as much as we can and we keep on trying to find ways so that we do not um, misuse someone mm. else's roots. And I suppose, you know, if, if we're honest, you know, there's there's internal cultural appropriation going on, external cultural appropriation going on, if we like, all all the time. We appropriate our own culture. I've spent a lot of time recently thinking about the notions of Celtic spirituality and how we um we we trawl our past and, and present it as something that's that maybe isn't quite uh yeah, what is the truth in there? So I think it's it's just a good question to ask and, and presumably a key differentiation is the intent with which we 
engage with other cultures and other traditions and the respect which we show and, and the seeking of, of clarity from those who own that culture from the inside out. When I was with Indigenous leaders in Australia and New Zealand, we were always encouraged to, if you don't know how to address one of the elders, you simply ask and you guide, you follow exactly what it is that they ask of you. So, um, yeah, thank you for that. I'm reading a wee comment here by Lynn. Um, one of our great challenges in Christian practice is getting out of our heads and into our bodies. Um, so thank you, Lynn, for that. And I'm going to invite Lynn, do you want to come up and, and have a conversation with Pauline about that? It's Lynn Mackey. Do you want to just come up and share your thoughts with Pauline? Sure. Um, actually, Pauline, uh, I, first of all, I need to apologize. I arrived late because I couldn't find my Zoom link. Um, but uh, so my entry was somewhat disruptive and I was in a small group and all of us were quite enthusiastic about the resource. Um, I'm a minister in the United Church of Canada and I'm a retired minister, but always my struggle has been to help people really experience their faith entirely throughout their whole being. And, and that's not just in mind and spirit, but also in body and in our energy, in, in our energy realm. And... I, and I find that people honestly uh, find that so helpful to them um, in facing all of the challenges in our world right now. Um, I, I'm part of a yoga group, uh, a traditional half of yoga group as well. And the leader of our group um, really approaches this, the practice from a from a faith base, but but not a religious base, right? So she's not, in fact, she herself is a Muslim. She teaches Hatha yoga. She takes people from our group to India to meet with the yogis. And there is such a deep receptiveness amongst those great teachers, the original teachers, uh, for the sharing of these practices with respect in a variety of faith traditions. So, uh, you know, uh, as we talk about um, our concern about cultural appropriation, um, I think it's I think it's always very important for us to be really mindful and to be very respectful and to ask permission. Um, but I, but I, my experience is that. Permission is very readily given. And um, I've experienced a number of yoga practitioners who then um, offer yoga postures, particularly in the area of connecting with um, the principles of wild church and reconnecting mm. with nature, right? Um, and I appreciate their work a lot, but I find that your, I mean, the fact that you are a minister of the Church of Scotland, um, your depth of experience with theology is what makes this such an amazing resource. I think we've got uh, a little fan club here, Lynn. This is great. Um, do, uh, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to, I, yeah. Well, no, I I've gonna, talked have way long enough. No, no, uh, did you have a, you, yeah, Pauline, do you want to respond to that? I mean, that's a beautiful, beautiful affirmation, Lynn, um, for all that Pauline has brought. I'm just very, very grateful, Lynn, and, and maybe we can stay in touch somehow after this. I think it would yeah. be good to have more conversation. I um, would love to. Yeah, yeah. let's do I that. Think, I think I've said far no, way that, now. That's really <laughs> great. Thank you. And I, I wondered if we could segue into Tony. Tony, do you want to come up? I, I did mention your question, but I wonder if you've got a, a response or a, or a further thought about the ways that different prayerful practices um, sit alongside others. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Just, just to kind of fill out the question a bit. Um, we talked about it a little bit because one, one of the uh, people in my small group, Joyce Muir, uh, is a, a pretty intensive um, yoga practitioner. Um, so I asked her the same thing. 
Um, and I think her answer was more or less like yours, that, that there's a kind of a sort of osmosis, maybe, that, that what, what you do in various kinds of Christian devotion can seep into, but, but probably more uh, the, that gets taken up into um, a, mm. a, a more physically based uh, practice. And I think that's very interesting. Um, and it, it, it also relates to this business about um, appropriation. Because what I did a course before Christmas about um, mindfulness and Christianity, and the whole mindfulness business has been a sort of massive appropriation of Buddhism, um, turned into a kind of chopped up and dried kind of Western um, practice. Um, I think what's interesting about, uh, and you can learn to do it, and, and it and it doesn't seem to have any any direct way of connecting to uh, to what we think of as prayer. I, I think what's interesting about what I haven't looked, read your book yet, I'm afraid I haven't even got a copy yet. But what, from what you've been saying, I think what's interesting is the challenge it presents because it means that you can stop worrying about all sorts of praying that none of us much like doing and quite often don't do anyway you know uh it, the, the either the, the shopping list prayers that we grew up with or, or whatever else that we've imposed on ourselves and um kind of learning to be more fully present in in the body in your own body and recognizing that there and actually nowhere else anywhere anywhere else you can encounter god except there um, that's that's quite a challenge to us, mm. um, and kind of breaking out of that um, the straitjacket that we've given ourselves, which we've had, you know, for hundreds of years, that we're all stuck in our heads. It's all going to happen up here. Whereas uh, trying to do something which is more um, holistic, I don't like the word, but you know what I mean. The, the kind of that that that. So you you bring all of yourself, and we sing about this sometimes. Some Christian hymns are about bringing your whole self and your and your body. Yeah, but we don't often do it. You know, I think maybe that's why the pilgrimage is important on Iona. Yeah, yeah, and because... and you know, people like Ian Bradley have written about the early Celtic monks, and and you know, theirs was a very bodily religious tradition. They they worked in the fields, yeah. and they they went into the sea, like we sometimes do still, and they and they prayed. Um, very very physically very viscerally in their bodies and they they, they were they, they 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 kind of used their bodies as a litmus test for how close they were to their creator so we do have that within our western uh celtic tradition um however we um appropriate that in a good way um yeah thank you pauline do you want to respond to tony yeah, just very quickly, Tony, thank you so much. I feel you really get it. And uh, one of the wonderful things about this book is identifying more and more people in the country that do get this. He hasn't even got it yet, so he's got to get it. <laughs> yeah, what, he, what he's getting is the intention. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, for a long time, I felt there were very few of us that really were in this right now, but it feels like there's more and more and more people that are, are really getting it. And, and, and what it is you're getting from me is that sense that the body is a sacrament. So our bodies, you know, are able to, when we tune in and really listen to the body, they're a revelation of, 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 of God, a revelation of Christ in whose image we're made, is, is there, right here, right now. Um, it is about the yoga postures, but more than anything for me, it's about the breathing. Uh, and when my mum was dying, I recognised the importance of the breath. When she no longer had cognitive capacity, to read her Bible, to say the prayers she grew up with, or to sing the songs, but she could breathe. And she she said to me there and then, um, I feel close to Yahweh, you know, Yahweh, the Hebrew name for God. She was very, very devout Christian, but she had this sense of the Holy Spirit still with her, present with her, through her breath, breathing her. Not that she was sort of breathing, but it was breathing her. And that sustained her to end of life. And, and my dad and I were there to her last breath. And that final exhale felt very, very, very sacred, almost as if it was a, a sacrament in itself. Um, not that she, her life had ended with the breath, but there was a sense in which who she was was going with that last breath to the source of all life and breath. Mm -hmm. um, and, and 
you know, that was that could only have been in her body. You know, it wasn't in the mind because by that point she was unconscious. Um, but the she was still breathing. You know, that sense of when the body was done, the breath was still there. So there's just something so vital about what is in us, God in us, that, um, yeah, it, it, it's just incredible. Thank you for getting it. <laughs> thank you. And thank you, Tony. Um, can, can I just have one tiny thing uh, more? I was listening to uh, Mark Burroughs earlier today, uh, who some of you may have heard. He's coming to Iona in the summer in June. Um, and he's got three books translated from this this medieval German mystic, Meister Eckhart. Mm -hmm. And he's turned them, he and John Sweeney have turned some of the things that Eckhart says into tiny little poems. They're absolutely tiny. Mm -hmm. But he quoted one of the things that Eckhart says in a sermon, which and, and he says, it, say you're walking down a country road and you see a young horse in a field. And it's a sunny day and the horse is just enjoying its existence and it's galloping around and kicking and all the rest of it. And and he said, Eckhart says, uh, that's the way God sees you. Yeah, yeah. I, I heard Mark Burroughs in the summer because he was the right. keynote speaker at the World Community of Christian Meditation Conference. And he also quoted a, a very small phrase by Eckhart. We are doers. So I don't know if you get my accent, but we are doers. And. I guess that's the thing about embodiment right now. People are, are done with doing and they just want to be, you know, and it's in that being yeah. that then suddenly there's that sense of the being that is also God as being with God mm. as your being. And that's what brings us so close to yoga, so cl close to Buddhism, mindfulness. You know, there's there's so much commonality in the being human, not not doing human life yeah Wonderful. thank you thank you um mark burrows uh, author and retreat leader and new member of the iona community um so here we are <laughs> um a little question here from fiona how she's appreciated the seat adoptions in the book pauline have you ever used these with a seated group who do not usually practice yoga for example a congregation um no not a congregation as such um, but yes, seated options really make sense. It felt so important to have them in this book for inclusivity um, and, and also to, to get away from the mindset that yoga is for fit, young, bendy, flexible people. Um, so, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm all open to invitations from congregations. Um, yeah, that's a whole other story. <laughs> um Thank you, Fiona, for that question. Um, there's one from from Claire about about our input from Claire. I'm just going to go to Jim and Aileen. You say if an Asian plays Scottish bagpipes, is that cultural appropriation? I don't know, Jim or Aileen. Do you want to join us and, and share a bit about that or not? It wasn't entirely flippant. I was wondering when you mentioned cultural appropriation to begin with, it sounded as if you were a bit concerned about it, as if perhaps it wasn't quite right. To appropriate other cultures. Um, I think it's mostly you know, used the whole of human history is about a cross fertilization. Yes. Uh, and and that we, we're always doing that. In fact, the flip side of that might be a concern among some more conservative Christians, uh, none of whom are likely to be on screen at the moment, <laughs> um, that in fact this is. Um, almost proselytizing on behalf of what to us is a foreign, um, if not faith, then then philosophy. And in fact, I was interested in connection with that point. At one point, spoke about being very careful uh, in, in using yoga not to offend what to some people is, uh, not to cause offense, because to some people this is sacred. Now, if it's, I wasn't aware of philosophy as being sacred, it's almost as if it's been treated as a religion, although you've specifically said it's not. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. So, that's for some, the yeah, interlinked for, subjects all together. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think I meant some of the, I, I mean, you know, it, it, the problem is East West, there, there is that sort of glitch in, in understanding, I guess. I mean, in 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 
in India, and certainly from the experience that I've had when I visited there in January 2020, you know, we sec we we in the West we tend to separate the secular and and, and the sacred. In India, you, you can't really do that. Everything is interconnected. Everything is interwoven. Um, there's that sense in which all of life is sacred. So even if you take something that's philosophy, it's sacred to them. That I think that's what I meant. Whereas here in the West, we have really split up. Um, you know, religion and even spirituality, we have to talk almost now as two separate things. I know when I was a hospice chaplain, we talked about spiritual care as the big umbrella for what we did in chaplaincy and religious care being something else. So we have all these sort of compartmentalizations going on in the West, in the East, not so much. Um, so I guess that's where the confusion maybe came in for you. And I, I'm sorry that if, if that happened, but you're absolutely right. Um, I've had no objections in the yoga community to me being Christian in that space or being a minister, but I do regularly um, receive um, concern, criticism, negativity, objection to the fact that I am entering into uh, yoga um, on behalf of, of, of Christians and as an ordained person. Um, the objections seem to be fear-based and anxieties um, about what will happen to Christians if they take a yoga class, mm -hmm. um, that they'll be being encouraged to worship other gods, that it could be idolatry. Um, the other objections I've heard are that it would lead people down um, a path towards the occult, um, that the powers of darkness would attempt to steal them from their faith as believers i've heard a number of things yeah. and it would be from the more conservative evangelical wing of the church but by no means everybody in that wing but just some individuals if you were to google evangelical alliances stance on yoga you would see all of those arguments still there even though that their their research they, they have an article that's 2016 that's the article that's on their website at the moment, it really badly needs updating. Truthfully, a lot of Christians have always practiced yoga, but maybe just not felt it was a problem or kept it sort of quiet, done it under the radar. Um, it, it's, it's a difficult yeah. situation to be in. Um, and I think one of the reasons for, for seeking to publish a book like this is to put these two words in the title and to, to give people permission um, and, and to, to be a champion and advocate of, mm. of why, why it's important perhaps to bring these two things together and what the benefits can be. Um, certainly the conversations I've had and I'm still having because I'm a minister and a Christian in these yoga spaces is phenomenal. Mm. Um, um, I mean, today I was at a yoga class taught by a Buddhist. Um, she's she's Western, but she's a Western Buddhist. And she wants to come to the book launch on Saturday in Carlisle Cathedral. She wants to buy the book. Um, you know, these are bridges that are being built yeah. as a result, conversations that are being had um, because it's now explicit. Yeah. In terms of, this is me. This is what I do let's 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 have a conversation about it thanks Polly. Oh, Thank, thanks times. Tim and Aileen and long may um everyone play the bagpipes around the world um, <laughs> fantastic and I think the thing about cultural appropriation is it's when it's used um somebody else's culture is used in a very particularly exploitative way that's yeah. the definition so that's why we have to be wary but everything you know there, there's so much more to say than 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 to worry too much um, necessarily about that. I'm going to invite, um, if you want to, Claire Sibley, you've um, given us a beautiful little glimpse into your life about exactly what Pauline's been saying about this um, yoga practices really being part of who we are for such a long time. I wonder if you want to come up and share a bit more about that and also um, taking, pushing the boat out here and wondering if Sharon wants to come up too. Sharon, you've offered us some lovely little reflections. If we don't cultivate being, our doing runs out of steam. Um, and both of you represent the Iona community in different ways. And I just wondered if you wanted to come up and say anything more about what you've written. 
and you don't have to if you don't want to. I'd like Claire to go first. You can come together if you want. Okay. <laughs> come on up. It's, it's, it gets lonely up here. Let's have Sharon. And Claire, Claire, you're a member of our community, Claire, um, and you, you've shared that comment. Um, and you kind of symbolize for me somebody who, the, we have the cat and the monkey carved into the stones of that south facing window in Iona, the contemplation and the action. And you embody that for me. Do you want to say a bit about the, the, the place of mindfulness and yoga practice in your own spiritual life? Just to say, you know, 15 years ago, a friend of mine set up Mindfulness UK and needed some people to undertake the eight week uh, course, the, 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 the course that was originally set out for stress reduction. And so I went along and one of the practices, she was also a yoga teacher. One of the practices was a yoga, a yoga session. I'd done yoga in bits and pieces over the years. And I did the course. I enjoyed it. It was at a time when I wasn't exploring my faith. I wasn't going to church. Um, I had been in the past, but it was a very dry time for me. I'd been working very hard, um, children, all the rest of it. So um, on the back of that course, it really I really felt God speaking to me in my times of stillness and my times of quiet. And so I, yeah, just I have carried on doing that. And I came back to Iona Abbey uh, on a course in 2014 and from that also came back and developed my own little yoga routine um, embodying the prayer that I wanted to say as a result of having been on Iona so it just ticked all the boxes for me so thank you for, for for doing this book but I I do worry about it being a book and for me I need to there was somebody else who said it would be nice to hear it and I've also been on Iona in the last year and Sharon has led some wonderful body movement sessions at the Abbey. And, uh, you know, I, I know that voice is so important and hearing it. Great segue into Sharon, who is our program, Assistant Program Manager on Iona. Sharon, it's great to have you here. Do you want to say a bit about your connection with yoga and why you happen to be here tonight? Oh, um, I was a Presbyterian, I've been a pres. I am a Presbyterian pastor and I had some continuing ed time and I have always, I've loved dance and I've never been able to pray sitting still. My mind is so busy. It's a monkey mind. And I did a week of yoga and fell in love and ended up training, um, with a, a studio that, that had a therapeutic uh, lens on yoga, using it for depression or anxiety or with those who are dying. Um, and so it's just something for my own spiritual practice. Um, I, I, I have someone else, I think, um, mentioned when we move our bodies, we, we, we get it calm, we calm ourselves down. And then my monkey mind is quiet as well. Um, and I've, I have shared, I have taught in churches in, in back home in the United States, um, chair yoga, um, people have loved it. And, and, you know, been able to infuse in spiritual, um, spiritual readings and sayings from our Christian tradition. Um, and I think one of my favorite uh, lines that I love is from Richard Rohr. He's a fan Franciscan priest. Um, and he says, we cannot not be in the presence of God. The question is, are we present enough to notice? And I feel like that's what, when we're, when we're in our bodies, our minds can go to the future and our minds can go to the fast go to the past, but only our bodies are in the present. And to me, that's the gift that yoga or mindfulness brings. Um, it's an awareness of our bodies. And then, then we, we, we can't help but, but, but be there. Um, mm -hmm. But one more thing I will say, I was going through a horrible spiritual crisis in my life as well. Um, I was doing yoga and I said, where are you, God? And I literally heard I am in your breath. And that's what yoga is, is focusing on your breath and moving your body with your breath. And I, I will never, ever forget that. That was, that's a cherished, yeah, mm. experience Thanks. for me. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. And I guess I'm, I want to wrap up then with a question, Pauline, to you about, you know, you've, you've heard from members of the Iona community and, and staff of the Iona community about the ways in which we have, um, loved we love what you bring um and we're so grateful to you 
we in the Iona community were known for worship renewal, we're known for activism and, and peace and justice, and we're known as a praying community. We have a prayer circle and a prayer ministry that is deep and, and long and slow and powerful. We're not really known as a community that is well versed in contemplative practices. I think we could do better at this and, and probably talk ourselves up a bit more. What would your one message be to the Iona community um, today? Uh, you've given us this wonderful gift of a book what more might you say to us to help us be more true to our spiritual roots and our spiritual calling I think there's something about the interconnectedness of it all of all that you are and all that your members and associates bring in the same way that um mind body breath brings the unity that we long for a wholeness that we long for it is about the balance of it the balance of it all and i mean if right now i asked everyone here to sink their weight into the soles of their feet into the ground to place their hands on their belly to sit back in their chair to close their eyes and bring their mind to their hands, to their feet, to their breath. It would only take seconds until you found that interconnected sense of being. And somewhere in that interconnected sense of being, I hope and pray there would be a sense of the other, which is the, the people around us that we share this room with, with the space we're in, in our home or our street, but also a sense in which a deeper connection with the earth, with all living things that move and breathe. And more than that, anyone who picks up this book to encounter Jesus, who I believe is still very much present and alive for us now. Mm -hmm. So yeah, the interconnectedness of it all and just dwelling in that, mm -hmm. being in that, and discovering the being who is God. I mean, thank you. Um, I wonder, before we hand back to Jane, just to wrap up, you gave us a little tiny glimpse of if I was to ask you to plant your feet firmly on the ground. Might you, for those who want to, might you just offer us a, a little opportunity to, to, to close this this part of the evening before I hand back to Jane with a little exercise that like, is that okay absolutely fine um I have a cat here <laughs> the contemplative cat um so it's very much up to to all of you you could stand you could sit you could kneel you could lie down so decide what posture makes most sense for you in this moment And then once you feel more settled and more still, could you take the palm of one hand to your belly and the palm of your other hand to your heart center, your sternum. And either with your eyes open or your eyes closed, feel, feel and sense how your body moves when you breathe. The expansion. The contraction. The opening. And the closing. The lifting. And the lowering. Taking longer, slower, deeper breaths. You are your breath. I am my breath. We are the breath. Each breath in and out is connecting us. Nor 
north, south, east and west, waking or sleeping, war or peace, love or hate, dancing or crying, searching or giving up, planting or tearing down, birthing or dying, holding or letting go, the breath, your breath, my breath, our breath is connecting us all right now on this planet and connecting us to the source of all life and all breath. God in whom we live and move and have our being. If you can, stay here for one minute in the quietness. As we come to the end of that practice, you might like to wriggle your toes or your fingers. Notice if there's any reluctance and maybe take an even longer exhale. Listen to your body, be guided intuitively how to move. Maybe a stretch or a bend or a twist or bring your shoulders to your ears or take your head around from side to side. And when you're ready, you might like to open your eyes if they're closed. And you might also just like to say peace be with you to the people in all these little boxes on the, the screen. Thank you so, so much for being so interested in the work in the book. And um, feel free to be in touch. The website's in the book or Iona Books will let you know how to be in touch. I'm really happy to hear from you and carry on the conversation. And it's very feel free to Feel free to unmute yourselves if you want to, everybody, and say, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Thank you, Holly. Yeah. Your um, details are in the, the chat as well. Um, I'm going to hand back to Jane now to close our session together. I feel like me, that Pauline has closed it so beautifully with peace be with you that I have very little to add other than my deep thanks for coming for being with us and please do visit our website keep an eye on our books Pauline thank you so much you're a wonderful author and we're very happy to be publishing you Ruth thank you so much for your time for your insightful questions and your leadership so everybody we will see you at the next I hope author event. Thank you. Thank you. And peace be with you. Thank you.